you're listening to the Neil Lamptey Show. My name's Joey, and I'm joined by Neil. Hello, Joey. And as a, as we've got no Paul this week, we're joined by little Eddie Wilson. From five years ago, little Eddie Wilson. No How's way. it going? Yeah, hello. Five years in the podcast wilderness. Yeah. That's a, a warning against ultimatums, isn't it, for me? It's the most excited I've been um, in several days. Yeah, well, when I said five years ago, it's me or Paul, I really... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think I really, that one through. Yeah, I really hope for a different answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good to have you back. What have you been doing in the last five years? Um, Great stuff. Festering. Anyway, so... <laughs> Festering, yeah. I mean, that's a long time festering, yeah. isn't it? Uh, yeah, but gonna... it's, it's just it's water under the bridge now, isn't it? Water under the bridge. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the terrible thing happened, and now we've yeah. all moved on, haven't we? So it's good that we yeah, can and... get this, yeah, get the show on the and, road. And he's not here this week, so yeah. so we can yeah, we can pretend it didn't happen. Hmm. Um, question to start this week off from Dave Robinson on Twitter with Mr. Ed Wilson's return in mind have we ever had a player who has been as good or better in their second spell with the club uh, Neil I'm going to throw it to you first I took this one very seriously and I went through the list of entire Cobb players trying to trying to see if there was anybody and the only one that even came close because I don't think there has been anybody who's been better second time around was Gail Biggeram Gail Biggeramana in his third spell. Interesting. Club. So that's it. The rest, nah. I mean, I kind of thought Doyle, but that was only because I thought he was rubbish the first time around. But um, being realistic, he, he's probably not. Uh, Ed, did you uh, did you have an opinion on this? Well, like Neil, I did a lot of research on this and I took it really seriously. And like him, the answer I came up with is no. <laughs> and the only caveat that I could think of was Big Romana for that third spell. But then even that is tainted, isn't it, I think, by a sense of the sort of emotional trajectory of his career at that point. So the first spell, even though finally didn't win anything and that kind of thing, there was a sense that maybe he was going to be something pretty decent True. third time round, less so. Um, yeah, fair dues. I, you two say that you did your research, right? But I'm going to ask, did you do your research? Yeah. It's worth it, Joey. What you got? Uh, well, because I think if you did even a cursory bit of research, you will found what was quite a spoilery article written by Jim Brown just over a month ago that is entitled, Jim Brown, They Had Two Spells at City, and is an exhaustive list of all of the players that have had two yeah. spells at Cobb. Yeah, which kind and of... that article constituted my research. <laughs> it kind of... I had, to, I had to take back my trench coat and magnifying glass for the detective work that I was expecting to do and kind of was just like, well, that's quite oh. good, yeah. <laughs> um, it really doesn't even... I, there wasn't really anyone, is there? No do, one. Do you count Ben Turner's, what, three games or whatever it was as being better? Probably not. Um, they were a good three games, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, even Richard Duffy got worse on each successive loan spell, so that doesn't really count either, does it? Um, so, yeah, that is a, an entertaining diversion to start us off. Why don't we go into Moments of the Week from here? Neil, hit, hit me. Well, mine, mine came about a week ago, actually. So I went on the, on the pod last week, so this probably happened before that. But I got an email, from a suspicious-looking email from PayPal. You know, one of those where someone just deposited money into your account and it was a sort of a foreign name. So I thought, oh, yeah, this isn't right. So I jumped in there and um, lo and behold, somebody had actually deposited some money into the Sky Blues blog um, fund, um, which I have hidden away on my blog. But it was a lovely chap called Einstein Nutzen from uh, Norway. So I've had a nice little conversation with him via email and he's just telling me about why the hell he supports Comedy City being in Norway and he also had a couple of questions so I'm going to throw those in if that's okay first of, of all who made the jingle for the Neil Empty show Actually, um, that, that was me yeah that was a Joey um, it's a Joey original yeah very nice um, and the second question I know it's not listening to questions but if Ryan Haynes gets fit again do you have him as a winger that is an interesting question it is indeed yeah Ed thoughts um, well, I suppose I suppose we'll speak about that a little bit when we talk about the Colchester game. But um, based uh, almost exclusively on that uh, alone, he was one of the few kind of meaningful attacking threats, I thought, out wide. So I think that could be a serious possibility. Um, any more questions from, from our, Vi- our Viking no. listener? Or? 
but I just wanted to give a, a, a name check because it's a lovely name, but also he's a big fan of both me, good man, and the show as a whole. So thank you. Can I just offer a quick word of, of warning for you, Neil? Go on. Now, I'm sure it's, it's lovely to have someone appreciate your writing to, to the extent to which they're willing to actually give you cold, hard cash for it. But have you seen a little known film called Misery? <laughs> I, I haven't, but this is sounding ominous. Ed. I suggest having a watch before you take a drive through a secluded part of Norway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very fitting with the snow included. My question to you, Neil, was going to be whether you had spoken to him on webcam. And that was one of the part of the, um, the services rendered for that money. As a matter of fact, Joey, um, no, I haven't, not yet. Um, okay. Maybe. It maybe. does feel a little bit like he's become like a sort of renaissance patron of your work. Because if you had multiple people making these donations, that would be one thing, wouldn't it? But to have a single donor. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 I'll tell you what, that's a lot of effort because I've hidden it away. I can't be that man who says, please donate to me, even though I have mentioned it on this podcast. But I've, I've had two so far ever, which is... Fairly spectacular. It's also quite damning, um, I would say. No, I'm quite impressed, I it, yeah. No, I think that's quite... It is impressive, but it confers a degree of personal obligation, I think, on your part to those two people. Mm. Indeed. Like, I, I wonder if they might start saying, I want you to write something <laughs> yeah. for me. <laughs> I, I need to put in a disclaimer, don't I? I don't mm. know. What would it cost? Are you buyable to that extent, Neil? Would you write separate blogs that were, hey, yeah, you're right. You know, how's it, go- <laughs> how's it going? Can't buy me, man. Can't buy me. Apart from if you're Liam McKenzie and you give me your book and I might write something about it, um, which I didn't actually read. <gasps> <laughs> or that, did he send it to you? But his publisher did, didn't he? Oh, but okay. I only read um, Steve Phelps' new book, which is out at all good bookshops at the moment. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Sorry, go on, Ed. I was just going to say there's real rom-com potential, isn't there? If he confesses to you that he himself is inarticulate, ineloquent, and he is in love with a girl that he's met on the internet, but he wants you to write a sequence of emails to her, whereby you sort of seduce her verbally on his behalf, but inevitably you would then fall in love with her and she would fall in love with you. And that's when we get back to the misery scenario of you chain to a bed. <laughs> to be honest, it sounds like the role I was born to play. You know, I'm the guy in the background writing, you know, seducing this person, but less I, I don't get the person. Can I be clear about this? Are you seducing her with blogs about Cov? Oh, it's been known, Joey. Don't you don't you be so that, dismissive of that? No, I'm I mean, not I'm not i I'm not suggesting that's not I just wondered whether that was part of it or whether he makes the sort of um literary leap that your cov blogs would then sort of translate into <laughs> florid poetry, perhaps. Mm, it's very much my niche, isn't it? So um, I, I wouldn't want to d- not dismiss the idea of that they, that could happen, but um, I probably would have to branch out into you know, other, other genres, maybe saying someone's name over and over, which is also quite good. <laughs> if there were to be a romantic author of the four of us, it's Paul's who I would be most inclined to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just I love you in caps lock, but with love spelt wrong, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Many sort of conflated cliches. And Sorry, Paul, I didn't mean that. <laughs> oh, man, he's not even here to defend himself. I think Sorry, Paul. Terrible. I didn't even mean that. I meant metaphor, <laughs> not cliche. <laughs> uh, Ed, what was your moment of the week, if we can uh, bring it back? It actually comes from uh, during the game on Saturday. Now, Uh, Can I begin a moment of the week by delving considerably further back into the past? Yeah. Little trip down memory lane, the late 90s, humanity's greatest decade. Yeah. I'm sure we'd agree. Um, But that's about to come to an end. But Paul Scholes preserves the kind of magic of the 90s with a goal, a volleyed goal scored (laughs) from a cross from a corner do we all remember that though it's one yeah. of the one of the great goals in the history yeah. of of um the premier league when football began yeah well on saturday <laughs> michael doyle attempted to recreate that moment <laughs> he did indeed yeah with jordan shipley and the results were genuinely astonishing i don't know if um 
I don't know if you've ever seen the footage on YouTube of when the Marseille Ultras, when Marseille were going through a phase of being particularly bad, and the Marseille Ultras took a big speaker system, a big PA, into their end of the ground, and every time Marseille got on the ball, they played the Benny Hill theme music <laughs> as a sort of yeah. um, satirical musical yeah. commentary on the incompetence of the players. Well, this would have been perfect for Doyle's attempt at doing uh, a Paul Skulls on Saturday. So Shipley uh, floated uh, a crossover for him. Not bad, actually, Neil. Would you agree? No, it was all right. A little bit high, but no, it was worth a, yeah, worth yeah, a go, wasn't it? I mean, it was workable. Um, yep. And <laughs> uh, Doyle uh, swung his leg at it and he shanked a perfect return pass yeah. out to Shipley, who had just come in from, from the corner flag, having taken the corner. Um Shipley went to control it. It rolled under his studs. He fell over and it ran out of play for a goal kick. So noteworthy. I have this on my phone. I recorded it. I thought, this is, I, I must keep this moment. Don't let this get lost in the archives. And yeah, so I do have it. And I'll, I might post it on Twitter after this. It was a real treat. It was a real treat, wasn't it? It's been a real standout season so far for um, incredible gaffes. It is, a, it is a Danny Baker video in the waiting, mm. isn't it? To list some of my favourites so far, the Liam Kelly effort against Barnet that oh. felt like he was maybe 80 yards away. <laughs> he, just, he was like, I don't care how far yeah. away I am or how many people are ahead of me in better positions. I'm just blutering this one out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, Lee Burgess, brain fart, Liam O'Brien against Newport. It's, um, yeah, we're really on for, for quite a, a video at the end of the season. It's gonna, yeah, it's call, call Nick Hancock. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good. So that's more our level, isn't it? I mean, Danny yeah. Baker's a bit too high. Oh, high yeah, far, far too. But, but you know the other thing, when I, when I was thinking about that, that got me thinking about, about what Marseille, those Marseille fans done. I thought that was such a brilliant idea. And I wondered, right, if you could have your own PA system in the ground... And you could use a piece of music to provide a soundtrack to what was going on on the pitch, some sort of comment on what was going on the pitch. What would you go for? Oh, wow, you sprung that on us. Oh, sorry, should I have no, given you a prior warning about that? No, I always like the, the grandiose nature of the Titanic music. On top of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just feel yeah. like that, the, the, the contradiction there would be quite fitting. There's something very, very pleasingly symbolic about all that, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> Um, wow, yeah, no, I might have to come back to you on that one. I'm okay. not, um, yeah. Um, I don't think I've even got a moment of the week. I guess my moment of the week is the fact that I, at lunchtime today at work, sat down and watched the 10 minute highlights on iFollow <laughs> and literally can't remember a single moment of them. Um, yes. <laughs> but, yeah. but a number of hours later. And I, I wasn't there on Saturday, but I am going to hazard a guess, Ed, that that might be reflective of the game as a whole. Yeah, I think, um, I think it was fairly dire, to be honest. And, and, and um, it's completely indicative of uh, some of the kind of major failings that they're obviously experiencing at the moment. So um, a couple of, uh, of changes to the starting lineup, which actually, as we alluded to earlier... I thought one at least might be encouraging, which was Ryan Haynes coming in for uh, Chris Stokes. And uh, then Stuart Bevan, obviously coming in to replace uh, Biamu. And uh, Neil, I don't know if you agree with this, but for the first two minutes, it looked like uh, they might actually be able to pose some sort of threat to um, the Colchester defence. You know, the the first kind of five minutes of the match, they... They pinged it around fairly quickly. There was some quite um, sort of rapid passing. Um, uh, Jody Jones managed to uh, get a bit of space um, on the right flank early on. Uh, and he, he floated in a cross, um, which, uh, which resulted in a pretty poor, a uh, pretty tame header from Mark McNulty. Do you think I'm being unfair in saying it was poor? Maybe it was, maybe it was slightly behind him. Maybe it was difficult for him to... It, it was a windy day. I, I always throw that caveat in there. I mean, to be honest, I, I forget that his first two minutes because I spent maybe the first 10 minutes worrying that someone was going to steal my seat. Um, I had new seats this week and I'm always very anxious about that. So mm. I was um, just looking around. I couldn't couldn't relax or anything. I was expecting to get booted out. So sorry, can't help you. But OK, windy. so you're trapped in this kind of curb your enthusiasm style 
nightmare. Which uh, is about... my life, yes. <laughs> Neil, Neil, explain <laughs> that more. Curiosity. So you took up your seat. How could somebody have usurped a seat well, from beneath you? This is what happens, Joey. Um, so I, I got two of those Sky tickets for this game. I did um, three Sky tickets. But then there were three of us because my dad came along. So he wanted to join us. And basically, I, I was feeling that anxiety for the group. I was legitimately in my seat, but my dad was alongside me who I wasn't see. in his seat. So, yeah, that, that panic was real. Yeah. Okay. But actually, I would go even further than that. I think, Neil, any time you get a ticket for something, I'm like this. You sit down. <laughs> I check. I check like five, ten times that I've got the right row yeah, and the yeah. right seat. And even if I'm convinced that I have, it takes a good five, ten minutes of the event to a bit to to pass before that anxiety abates. Yeah, that is that is life. I mean, I've never had an issue with finding a seat. I, I don't get these people who get to the front and then they just stand there looking up for like ten minutes. Yeah. I mean, they're fairly well labelled. <laughs> I don't think it's that hard to go go wrong, but um, certainly. Just that self-doubt, wondering whether that is your seat or not. That's, I, that's, that's always there. I don't want to psychoanalyse either of you, but perhaps were you asked to move seats as a child? <laughs> I'm always being asked to move seats, even my own seat. They, they just see me coming. Oh, he's, he looks a bit nervous. <laughs> so let's see what we can do. Um, the, well, that's the first 10 minutes covered. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, so we've, got, we've got sidetracked. So, um, I, mean, I mean, essentially... Uh, there's very little of note to say. Uh, the half just kind of drifted uh, after those first few minutes. Um, very little action on either side. Obviously, um, Jones picked up uh, an injury and there was that sort of um, anxiety uh, kind of circulating around um, around the ground when that happened. Uh, and, um, and he had to go off. Uh, he was done for, wasn't he? He looked clearly yeah. injured. I mean, I, I feel like that was very much... I had a, that injury once before, um, that knee clash thing. And you, you, you think, oh, maybe it's just hurting because he's not my knee. But then he just couldn't walk. And he, he's forcing it and forcing it. And you just think, now nah, he... Or, or what would have maybe helped, probably wouldn't have. But um, if he'd actually got the ball at any point during that period. But he, he just spent like, 10 minutes running around, not being able to get going again. So Yeah, with the game passing him by. But I mean... The game passed. The game passed really all of the uh, forward players by, with with the exception actually of Nazon. Um, I thought on one or two occasions. One thing that I found particularly frustrating about the Jones um, injury was that the the subsequent substitution was just conducted in an in a shambolic manner by the uh, by the City bench. So they were obviously desperate to keep him on the pitch. And I don't know if that was the reason that Robbins decided, right, well, I won't get anyone to go and start getting <laughs> ready or get warmed up or start to sort of strip off or anything like that. Because actually Jones was down the tunnel and had been off the pitch for probably a minute, maybe two minutes before they managed to get Shipley out on the on the field. And I just thought that was that was symptomatic mm. of how lacklustre and ponderous the whole thing was i mean it was so it was such a slow game um paul put a uh, a joke about um you know what's more uh what's slower um a glacier or a cov passing move on twitter and you know that was while the while the game was happening so he obviously felt um able to you know engage in some light social media activity <laughs> uh, it, it was it was so um uneventful uh, there was there was nothing happening and um nazar i thought he worked hard i thought he tried to get into the game he, he, he occasionally tried to drop uh into space just in front of the defense um but he was uh, often kind of trying to wrestle uh with with a couple of defenders at a time to, to make something happen he managed to beat people uh, a couple of times one point he was able to fizz um, fizz across uh, across the box, which nobody was able to to pick up on. Um, but uh, yeah, the whole tone of the first half was just caution, uh, and it was uh, it was incredibly ponderous. I thought the passing was was dreadful. Um, anything to add, Neil? I I'm a little less critical of the passing. Not so much. Uh, I mean, it was quite it was slow. I think we got nervy earlier than we needed to when it came to these passing moves. I mean, the alternative to what we were doing was to go long or to go more direct, which when we tried, 
it just was not sticking. So, I mean, it's always a kind of a, a toss of the coin of which one, which way do you go? I mean, I'm sure there's a lovely middle ground where you're a bit more incisive where you're passing, but we were in places where there was no forward pass. So your option is, do you go forward with it or do you just retain the ball and try and find another gap? And one thing I'm sure Robbins does tell the players to do is to, you know, value possession of the ball somewhat. I mean, don't listen to the crowd because we're going to get nervous regardless, but um, I think as the game went on, it became it became more sort of um, lacking in sort of anybody willing to take the gamble. I guess you you can afford to take a little bit more time on the ball in the first half, but as it moved into the second half, it just became kind of came like a mental blocker almost. I felt there was nobody willing to kind of grab the game and really sort of um, enforce something. What you say about there being no forward pass on, I think that's true. I don't know if it's so much people not being willing to take a gamble on trying to make a, a difficult pass, on trying to uh, make a pass that's risky, or if the runs just weren't there for people to actually pick those passes out. You know, it, it strikes me that the um, that the midfield two, um, Doyle and, and uh, Kelly, are, are really, really reluctant to break out of that, um, out of that kind of protective defensive mindset. Um, they're just not. Then there's no men really running from midfield. And essentially, I thought, um, with the exception of the two fullbacks, um, you're looking really at a broken team, almost uh, a team h- half of which are, are committed to defence, and then four uh, attackers um, trying to make something happen with varying degrees of effectiveness. Um, actually, in in their um, uh, in their defence, uh, Haynes and Grimmer uh, did have a go. Um, at, yeah, at providing yeah. something, uh, but um, I, I do think it's I do think that midfield pairing is problematic. It'd be good to hear more about Haynes. He came up quite a lot on last week's discussion about should he come back in? Could he come back in? Would he go in as a left back or a left sided midfielder? What what? How did he play? He was left back, wasn't he, on Saturday? Yeah, so he, he played left back, and and I thought it was just a, a sort of quintessential Haynes performance. Really, got forward a lot. Um, he was a threat. And in fairness to him as well, I, I thought generally um, his contributions were, were quite meaningful. I mean, even in the last few minutes, he was pushing to get forward. Um, he unfortunately missed what looked to me like a, a, a glaring, glaringly good opportunity from a header. Not his, not his strong suit, obviously. Um, again, Neil, did you, did you agree that looked like a, a clear cut chance to me? I, it was very much a Biamu kind of chance where he's been having those um, sort of headers. So, yeah, I, I would expect him to at least get on target. There was very little around him. You could maybe put it down to, like you say, it's not it's not what you know him for, but he's he is a defender. He should have some control over his um, head. So that's, that was a shame. But he did offer he did offer a significant amount of threat. And I do think that's um, I do think that's a marked improvement. Um, I know that uh, I know that Paul was advocating maybe trying out a back three and using Haynes as a wing back, which seems to me like a, like a possibility. We talked about that in terms of English teams being very uh, unable to get that working. Is that, I mean, you're a learned continental gentleman, aren't you, Ed? Is that something that you would subscribe to? Do you think that we should just go for it? Well, do I think they'd be able to play that system? Yeah, why not? Punt a, punt a speculative opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's, that there's anything necessarily inherently more difficult about that system. And I don't think, I think it's surely a thing of the past, whereby we're sitting here saying, oh, English footballers can't play anything other than a four four two. I mean, that can't be the case, can it? But in, surely... But empirically, especially in Cov fan world... That has been yeah. the case, hasn't it? It was the undoing of Mowbray and it was the undoing of Presley. Is that both of them? And obviously, that's probably an element of confirmation bias to say just because it happened with two Cov managers that all English teams can't play a back three. But there's, <laughs> but there's, uh, there's probably more examples of failed attempts than there are successful ones. But again, that's probably remarkably reductive, isn't it? To just say, oh well, when it do- someone tries it for ten weeks and it doesn't work and go back to a back four, so there's no way in, in hell that it can happen. But he did. Well, I know that he played a back three at Scunthorpe because when I went there a couple of seasons ago, they played a back three and they beat us two one. So maybe it works amazingly. I, all seriousness, though, I would be interested if somebody could tell me whether that he did implement that properly. 
But I think I think you're right about the confirmation bias thing. And you sort of think, don't you, if they were to introduce it now at a point at which confidence is obviously quite low uh, and things are generally uh, not going brilliantly, if it was a failure, would that be because of the system or would that be for a number of other reasons? So, you know, you change system, don't you, generally, because you think things aren't going uh, brilliantly for you. Does that then mean that it's difficult for that system to function properly because there are a whole host of other factors that are getting in the way of a good performance? I just think that with, I think, a couple of things. I think for it to have not worked when we bought Jordan Turnbull with specific um, reference to it working because he'd played in a successful back three and uh, he was very much seen as that player for us to not make it work under those terms i thought was unusual and i just for whatever reason it just seems like i say i'm probably wrong it just seems that mcdonald and willis who are quite comfortable on either side of their back two just heading the ball away and shanking balls out of uh, into touch for some reason i just have this feeling that if you dropped another person in there they would struggle with it, which is very difficult for me to reconcile because looking at the squad, it is probably the best thing we could do. We do have the players that could fit in there well. Devon and Dion Kelly Evans could possibly play there as a dream twin wing backs like we're watching the Hurricanes. Absolutely. Or, yeah, or you've got Stokes who could do it or Stokes that could drop into the left of a, of a back three. But I just, um, I'd like to see us try it, but I kind of just feel like, you know, if it hasn't worked in two separate, completely unrelated brief spells, why would it work this time? <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think more interesting is probably how the how the forwards would be configured in that system. So what would you see happening with midfielders there? Who's making you three? I So I think it's Jones is given a sort of free role, effectively, mm. for me. And I think that you probably are sticking... I think it gives you licence to stick with Kelly and Doyle because you've got the attacking threat from the wide players so that you could attack with five and you could defend with five or you could defend with seven, depending on, you know, whatever variation of that you wanted to do. I also think that means that you could then play a proper strike partnership, strike partnership, rather than this sort of like weird proxy sub Leicester four four two, where you've sort of got one striker playing deeper, despite the fact that they haven't really got any of the attributes for it. I think you could. Prob- something- I think you could probably play Biam. I I would still go. I'd still be interested to see <coughs> Nazon and McNulty up front together, but only because it hasn't been disproved yet. I suppose. Yeah, I mean, obviously th- there was there was sort of times uh, on Saturday when they were kind of playing together, but it was just, it was odd what was going on Saturday. I thought with rotation of positions and that kind of thing um, for for sort of chunks of the first half. Um, Nazon was was sort of playing uh, essentially as, as a left midfielder, um, which seems to me to be a total misuse of his yeah. strengths. Just a, just bizarre. Um, but then but then equally, I, I don't think it's it's fruitful to play Bevan um, or or McNulty out there either. Um, and there was there was a, a, quite a bit of interchanging of positions and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I thought it, none of it could mask the fact that essentially they were sort of just bereft of any of any um, attacking ideas, basically, and that those passes in the final third were just not happening. I think I could probably count, I think, maybe once that um, we got in behind the Colchester defence uh, and actually turned them. Everything else happened uh, in front, pretty much, maybe once, maybe twice, um, towards the end when they were getting a bit desperate and they were starting to throw bodies forward. Um, but uh, yeah, Colchester found it very easy, I thought, just to defend their 18 yard line. I think on the lack of goal threat or attacking threat posed by the central <clears throat> midfielders, we talked about it recently. I think they are acting under very strict orders to not go forward as opposed to not having the impetus to do because I think. Doyle, especially in his previous spell, and maybe he doesn't have the legs, but you know he still has the attitude. I think he does want to get forward if he gets the opportunity, doesn't he? But I think they're being told to sit back. And Paul made a really good point last week that I've ruminated on a little bit. Is last time round, he was able to attack with four and defend with everyone else because the four that he'd got were just insane, weren't they? It was McGoldrick, Baker, Musa 
who were just loose cannons that were just obsessed with scoring goals, weren't they? They were. They, there's no element of teamness about any of them, really. Oh, they I were, felt this warm, nostalgic glow when he reeled off those names. I know, and they were names that at the time we spent most of the time castigating for not being team players, <laughs> or at least I did anyway. And now you look back at it and think of it as this sort of failed golden generation of, yeah. of rogue mavericks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the but the now as much as we like a lot of those players. We are so de- they aren't huge goal threats, are they? Neil, you um, have the context of seeing many games in a row. We, you weren't with us last week to complain about two successive depressing one nil defeats. It's now mm. four games in a row that we've not scored in. I wonder whether you're a little bit more sanguine about your view of things. In the who. Watching the games by themselves, obviously, they they're horrible to watch. I've still I've still got an, like an element of perspective when it comes to thinking about how the season's going, and I, I'm, I can still put it into sort of um, isolation. Like these few games, it's it's more than just us being a bad team. There, there are other things, that, other factors at play. But I guess the, the issue that I'm seeing now, and it's certainly one which we're going to have to try and fix especially given the lack of confidence, is we now don't... I don't think we'll have Jody Jones for a bit. Um, I just think um, what happened looks like he's got a bit of an injury there. So, um, And we've always complained this season. Is, oh, we've only got Jones and Nazon. They're our attacking threats. And then the others sort of supplement them. Take Jones away. And we saw it very clearly. We, we don't have... We don't have anybody else. And the other annoying thing that's getting me at the moment is obviously the the changing rules around the fact that you just can't get any extra loans in or anything like that so you, we are quite literally stuck with what we've got and we've lost with tony and joe and jody jones two very creative players um and then that then off has to be sort of offset on the pitch and you you end up doing what we did at the weekend which is putting naz on on a wing just because he's the nearest suitable candidate and then you that kind of moves on to well the fact well, he's our best striker so you you end up Bereft of bereft of ideas up front because you've got Nazan on the right and it's just everything is impacting everything else and it's just I mean Robbins has to have a jolly good thing this week about how how he goes about fixing this because I, I do like the notion of um, sort of five three two wing backs however you want to dis- describe it and I always had in my mind that that three in midfield what a nice three in midfield would be Stevenson Kelly and Doyle with Stevenson given a bit of a license. And that may be one of the options that we have now that if, if Jody Jones isn't available, because obviously you'd have to find him a way to get him to the team. But I don't think that fixes the attacking issue. I think it makes us maybe a, a neater team, maybe more balanced side. But I just, my overriding feeling is I don't know who else we have to bring in because the options right now are not very good. And we're having to force Shipley out on the left-hand side who is young, still trying to find his way into them, the game. And he's... I think there's an element of a good player there, yeah, but it's it's very much forced. He's still trying to find his feet at professional level, and it's obviously nowhere close to having the same level of quality as uh, Jody Jones has. So um, I'm just I'm just worried because I, I don't think sticking with it almost the same team as we had in the last few games is going to work now that we don't have Jody Jones. So Robbins is going to have to come up with something a little bit different. With Chipley, I'm fascinated because I don't think you see this particularly often that as soon as he comes on the pitch. There is huge deference to his set piece taking, yeah, and he's pretty good, isn't he? he he's all right. Uh, he's got like a, a left foot. I think that always goes in your favour. A left foot player is always better at free kicks than a right foot player. That's the nominal sort of um, indication. I, I think he could. I'd much prefer him to aim for people. They've got a lovely shape to him a lot of the time, haven't they? So they are good sort of looking free kicks, but they don't seem to be sort of aiming for people, which is my that I'd probably be in letting the, the harshness of my judgment from the, the, the other game go against me there because I was very much desperate for us to score a goal. But, um, yeah, he's, he's obviously got something about that wand of left foot of his. <laughs> presumably, yeah. presumably they're all deferring to Shipley's uh, set pieces because Doyle has stood up in the dressing room before the game and said, listen, guys, Shipley and I have worked out something amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're going to wait for it. It's magic. Yeah. And if anyone gets in the way, I'll fill them in. Yeah. So that's terrified. Yeah, possibly. 
I, I got totally fixated when we had Joe Cole and it, there was that period around the point where we beat Berry. <laughs> That's where such it, an absurd sentence, isn't it? What's that? <laughs> Just the sentence when we had Joe Cole. Yeah, I know. It doesn't make any sense still, does it's it? It's totally absurd. But I think he created four goals. I think he made four goals in that game. And there was a period where if we got a set piece and he took it, we just scored from it. And, yeah, I, co- yeah. and I felt like I'm like I'd worked out football. I was saying to Paul yeah, in the car yeah. on the way back, I was like, I'm going to ring whoever the, I'm going to ring Mowbray and be like, listen, you just need to get <laughs> other people practicing how to kick a ball good in the air. And then we'll do all the goals. It's just like, it's that simple. I kept saying <laughs> the to him, moments, serious, aren't they? when you, when you work out football for a little bit, yeah. it's brilliant. It's like, this, this, this works. And then real life kicks in. I was like, I kept, I kept saying to Paul, I was like, why aren't there more people who can just <laughs> kick a ball really accurately at another man? He was like, I think there are. I think it's Seb Larson. I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Um, but apparently that isn't a thing you can do. No? Well, it might be. Maybe let's I see Other whether... factors come into play. Like, uh, yeah, being human beings, maybe. That, that kicks them into sometimes, doesn't it? Ah, uh, yeah. I like it, though. That Joe Cole period was fantastic. Another absurd sort of sentence. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I mean, have we got anything else colchester to talk about? Uh, did I'm going to throw it in there because I don't know what happened and I've still been looking for it. But didn't the steward get chucked down the stairs? And I don't want to get like they did. Out. They what did. happened there? Because the, uh, all I heard was a big ooh, and I don't know what happened. Yeah, there was a there was a rumble in the Colchester yeah. end, wasn't there? And they were trying to they were trying to get people out, and um, I think they were they were looking to get a couple of guys out, meaning there were about fifteen stewards going after two blokes now. I don't know if a steward was chucked down the, down the stairs or if the steward sort of just toppled backwards yeah. and fell down some rows fell down some rows of seats. But from a distance, it, it, it didn't it didn't look great. Well, I, what, what I couldn't quite understand was just how many people must have been watching that rather than the football because there was an audible. Ooh, oh yeah, it was, no, my, it was my, mid, mid game. I my dad and I were absolutely thrilled. <laughs> but I was like. How many? That just shows just how many people were watching this spectacle yeah. rather than what was going on on the pitch. This wasn't like yeah. during a break and play or anything. This was, I, mean, I don't know how long it was going on for. Maybe it was drawing people's attention quite easily. But um, that was a that was a loud old do. And and that is indicative of the sort of apathy I think that was that was evident uh, in the crowd on Saturday. I, I don't think people were even particularly angry. Uh, I, I, just, I don't think they can be bothered. Yeah. It's just it's just a sort of irritable lethargy that prevails. Um, but yeah, a, a bit of a, a, a there was there was a bit of action for your ticket money. Um, we've got no Dominic talking Luton, um, and we're not going to try and do a sort of Ersatz version of his thing. But I thought we'd maybe talk about some little bits. Their goal difference is plus twenty two, um, and. They are just... Show-offs. I know, just a winning yep. machine. Um, do either of you two hold out any hope? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're the eternal optimist, Neil. I guess that goes without saying, doesn't it? Good old football. That's do you really you think... Say is that what you're going for? You're going for, good, you're going for football we beat, bloody Yeah, out. we can beat them. Football, football, football. Keeps happening. That's the optimistic inverse, isn't it, of Ferguson's football bloody hell? Yeah. Is good old football. Yeah. <laughs> You daft football. Um, I, do you not think there's anything more certain in the history of time? They've got that James Collins, who mm-hmm. is one of the p- few people that's from Cov. It's like him and Ian Everett that are from Cov. Yeah, yeah. Um, that we constantly get talked about when the Telegraph is bored and haven't got anything to write about. He will score. I think he's already got a few against us, hasn't he? He will almost certainly score, which means that if we're going to get anything out of the game, we'll have to score one. Which is unlikely at the minute. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 did, I don't know if, if you've listened to the various interviews uh, with Robbins after the game, but um, it sounded to me, and and I, I, I like Robbins, and I think he's he's a good manager. I, I did think he sounded a, a little bit puzzled, um, and and a little bit short of of ideas about how he might fix it. I mean, the repeated mantra was just. We've got to work harder. We've got to work harder. 
on the training ground. And they're like, fine, you know, maybe he's got a brilliant plan. He's just not going to tell Jeff Foster what that brilliant plan is. Uh, having Jeff said Foster that, wouldn't think to ask. So. I was going to say, having said that, <laughs> Jeff Foster might try and find out by asking him a question. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't want to get on Jeff Foster's back, but... I feel like you're it, going to. Like, yeah, because I, 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 I just thought it's like listening to somebody being interviewed by Mist. <laughs> <laughs> a, a Jeff Foster interview. Yeah. Like, this... like you, you, he finishes speaking and... Then Mark Robbins has to try and extract a question <laughs> from a haze of words. Yeah. It's one of my... Fa- the best ever obvious uh, Jeff Foster moment is the Moosa interview against Preston, isn't it? Yeah. Where he got the score wrong, didn't he? He got the score wrong, yeah. But it's the... I mean, who, whoever took the photo is an absolute genius. Yeah. Is there's the... What's it? Is there's the Moosa look to camera as if he's Tim from <laughs> The Office? <laughs> <laughs> As if to say, are you, are you getting this? He's just like, yeah, you know, um, so you've lost today. He's just like, no, we drew. Yeah, whatever. Still bad at it. He's like, okay. <laughs> um, he does admirable work, uh, uh, Jeff. <laughs> okay, have we done it? I think that's everything, um, Colchester, isn't it? Have we got anything else at all? Put, uh, Neil, what's going on on Sky Blues blog? I heard you last week, so I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to answer this question. <laughs> I say the same thing. I would just like to... Just mention the words James Madison and the guy's oh. brilliant and the, he's going to be Prem player this season. I'm telling you now. Just go through the roll call for anybody that hasn't been following his um, efforts as slavishly as I know that we are. Oh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, he's had two awesome free kicks. Championship he, player of the month. month. Yeah, player of the month, goal of the month. Um, and dominating against Arsenal by all, all accounts tonight as well which I, I was hoping was on TV, and I did another stupid thing. And I, I saw that he was playing on um, Sunday. So I don't have Sky, but I pay for Now TV every now and again. So I quickly got the, you know, I'm going to throw a ten at this. I want to watch this game. Fucking five minutes to go, wasn't it? I, I, I misread, the, misread Twitter. So I, I had to um, I watched five, I paid another tenner to watch five minutes of James Madison. That's classic, Alison. Well, and as you and as you sat on your sofa watching the game, a stranger approached and said, uh, "Mate, this is um, this is my seat." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I live here, please. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, he's. Uh, I mean, the only goal in, uh, admittedly, what has been a, for the last ten years completely one-sided derby. Um, but did anyone yeah. else see that goal? And there's a player that picks it up. Um, like on the halfway line, opens his body up and strides forward. And as soon as he did it, I was like, that's classic Madison, that is. And then it turned out not to be him. And I was like, <laughs> I was <laughs> just, him, aren't they? just desperate to love him. <laughs> oh, he's so good. Yeah, what a man. That's a, that's a nice way for us to carve out a reasonably optimistic ending, isn't it? Is just talk about James Madison for a bit. Yeah. I was thinking about... Um, the Millwall game earlier where we won 4-0 and I was trying to think whether anything in life ever has been more perfect than that. It had everything. And a yeah. penalty save. Yeah, That's penalty good. save. Like, we, the second half, we defended really well. We, we were under the cosh for a bit but we just completely had them in our pocket and then Jim O'Brien propped up at the end and was like, oh, four. Yep. Yeah, it was beautiful. That's hard, to, that's hard to beat, isn't it, that? Yeah, it just had everything. Oh man! Still, I mean, it'd be good against Luton. So, pop, pop, <laughs> yeah. pop down there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, there, well, have we got Have we got any uh, qu- listener questions? We have, but they're never any good. Oh. Um Let me try and flick through and see if I can find some. Can anyone try and sort of fill a little? Oh, apparently I'm filling. James Phillip has asked, "What do you like best, actual goals or expected goals?" That's quite a good question, actually, isn't it? I mean, quite expected goals. One. Yeah, expected of all the, goals of all for the me stats, too. It's it makes you feel a little bit better about things, albeit well, yeah. for no reason at all. But it's interesting. How to make it? How to do it? But it's interesting because it makes it. For, I think for us is where it possibly falls down a little bit because I think we have a tremendous amount of efforts that don't contribute that aren't high scoring expected goal efforts 
but that they add up. So I saw that against Colchester, our expected goals was over two, wasn't it? What? It, yeah, but it's based on the fact that if you have a shot... I mean, that Liam Kelly shot against Barnet was like 0.0001 goals that contributes to the yeah. overall score. Cumulative, yeah. Yeah, but I think that we end up having so many long shots. And so, as well, the other thing that's characterised our attacking deficiencies this season has been six-yard box headers that have gone nowhere near the goal. And they probably count really high, yep. don't they? Because they should be scored. And it's really curious because looking at the expected goals makes it look like we've got really profligate finishers. But it is true. But that to me, the central problem seems to be the quality of the chances that we create. But that, would that really is the opposite story to the expected goals All, thing. Although, do, I don't know how they work here. I've not really done much reading into it. But what do they count as expected goals? What about if... The ball goes across the box and it goes through everybody's legs. And that happens about five times in the match. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. When one of them has to at least get, a, you know, if they swung their foot at it, they're probably going to get a goal. Yeah, I've, That's expected. I, I'm not entirely sure. I know that it's they sort of calculate the probability of, of an effort being... Right. But I don't know whether, the, like you say, actually, if the ball rolls along... Oh, my God, this is so philosophical. If the ball <laughs> roll along, rolls along the goal line and nobody's there to stab it in, does it, is it even a chance? It's, does it exist? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, it's, uh, I think it's reasonably flawed, but I think that there's nobody yeah. that likes football that doesn't accept that all statistical stuff needs an element of um, good old-fashioned peepers. To, uh, yeah, there's, um, to bear it out. There's, uh, it, I think that um, Craig Burley and Paul Merson both hate expected goals, which makes me think there must be something in yeah, it. Yeah, well, clearly, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know, I, mean, I think we might have talked about this before. I really like Paul Merson. <laughs> what, as a bloke or as a pundit? I, both. I, mm. I quite like <laughs> having someone who is just a buffoon. <laughs> Because I've, there's loads of places that you can find people who are really good at doing football opinions. Here, for example, <laughs> right? But actually, to be able to wade through that crap with yeah. just the most lunken opinions, I think is quite impressive. And I find him quite endearing. I like the fact that he's, you know, he's not shy, is he? Um, endearing, I, yes. Wally Brain, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I yeah. think... I think you're not giving Merce full credit here. I think that in sort of 30 years' time, actually, that's probably overestimating it. Let's say 20, because he was a heavy drinker. Let's say 20 <laughs> years' time, when he's nearing the end of his life, he's going to say, like, um, like Warren Mitchell, the actor who played Alf Garnet, he's going to say, I-, I was actually a satire <laughs> of, <laughs> yeah. of that sort of football man. Yeah. And I, and I knew exactly what I was doing. And um, and and all of you and all of you fell for it, but really, you know, I was I was mocking this sort of British streak of philistinism that's part of our football culture. Or I thought you were going to say that he was <laughs> um, as prescient as the film Demolition Man, and that we would hit a period after his death, or sort of he becomes irrelevant, and that all of a sudden all of the things that he predicted came true. Marco Silva all of a sudden is a bad manager. We look at his record and it turns out that he never won a game. We just never noticed it. Because <laughs> in he was the way such a... a prophet is never acknowledged in their own lifetime. Yeah, like, an, like an idiot savant is that we'd kind yeah. of just, we'd been like, ha-ha, they laughable. And then, of course, once he goes, it's like Joni Mitchell, isn't it? Don't know yeah. what he got till it's gone. <laughs> 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 yeah, poor old Merce. England's rose. Um... <laughs> Yeah. Any other good or bad pundits? No. That's, They're all media. I'll tell you what, no, no, I'll tell you what, actually, somebody who I've grown to like, and it's it's for similar reasons uh, to you with Merson, is Ian Wright. I knew you were going to say Ian Wright, and I feel exactly the same. Yeah, I, I've, I've really come to quite like uh, Ian Wright now. and um, and, and I think that I sense that he used to be a Merson style buffoon, but I feel that he's kind of cut loose and he's he's combining that with some quite outspoken kind of political comment, and he just doesn't care. He just he's just going to just going to say kind of what he thinks. I think he's liberated for some reason, Ian Wright, and he I think he's got quite good. 
I really like, there was a story about Ian Wright being an attacking coach who was drafted in temporarily at maybe Millwall or somewhere. And there's a story that came out that the extent of his attack coaching was, watch, was making strikers watch videos of him scoring goals while he told people how good the goals were that he was that they were watching. Which <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan of. That's what, if I was him, that's what I'd do. I'd just be like, look at this one. Look, look, look. Bang. Right in the back of the net. Do you think that Mark Robbins does that with that goal that he <laughs> scored to save to save Alex Ferguson's career, as it's always described? That that's all they do, really. The 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 forwards coaching. He just plays that video endlessly. He's just what he's talking about is not total goals or expected goals. It's important goals. Yeah, he's vital goals. Goals are a sacred commodity that need to be used sparingly. So you've got to make sure that they're epochal when they're scored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if a goal can't make a knighthood, <laughs> if a knighthood can't be built on the back of a goal, forget it's it. It's pointless. It's completely redundant. <laughs> yeah. He's, gonna, he's, he's like, look, listen, we've had a good start, but my job could be on the line if we don't score for a while. Let's get it there, then do an important goal. Then turn it round. Round. <laughs> Pull back and reveal. Yeah. Yeah, um, in, in 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 again, looking into the future, twenty years time. Sir Mark Robbins. Yeah. Am I the only one thinking that? Yeah. Services okay. to dinner ladying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um let's see if we've got any more questions then. I think we had a question. There's been questions about the Rico lease coming up. Has something happened that passed me by? Not that I'm aware of. Oh, I didn't think so. But then it's... Part- what about that fake... Well, I say it's fake. Um, that takeover thing on oh. Friday. Oh, that, all that stuff, yeah. which I desperately tried not to get involved in and then quite easily got involved in by the end of it. Um, I don't really know what's going on. Some bloke came on the radio um, saying he wanted to buy the club. He ain't going to buy the club. And that was about it, really. Yeah, and I suppose, like, I suppose more importantly, some bloke came on the radio. Some bloke was allowed to go yeah, on the radio yeah. saying, I'm going to buy the club. It's the, I, 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 <laughs> like, the worst part of it was, he goes, well, I've had, a, I've had conversations, you know, good um, talks with um, head of communications, Mark Hornby. Um, he forwarded on an email. That doesn't constitute talks. Yeah, and then that... there was this whole debate about whether they were, there was extra, I don't know, extra emails and extra talks, and it's just it bullshit in it half the time. I think we're very yeah. pro Mark Hornby here, aren't we? So I, I felt a bit like, do you know what? Fucking leave him alone. He's doing a good job there, isn't he? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. I think the the C- CWR are so happy to have anybody call that if you call. <laughs> <laughs> And you say, yeah, my name is Mr. God, and I'm going to buy Coventry City Football Club. Yeah. I'm just like, that's fine. Can you... Can Montgomery you feel... Burns here. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just fill, fill 30 seconds until Paul Knowles phones up. There we was. There we've got the night sewn up. Um, and um, final question from Chris Downs. Why does Mark Robbins keep saying without a shadow of a doubt in his... Um, post-match interviews Neil perhaps one you've got uh, any insight on because we like saying the same thing over it's like we've all got catchphrases haven't we there's mm. nothing wrong with that because it just it emphasises he, he was scrabbling wasn't he for um, any sort of any sort of emphasis the other day and that's why he was saying it because he, he didn't really have a, an important point to make so he was trying to emphasise the very banal ones that he was making this is it, isn't it? At times when you are quite literally beset by doubt, as he must be at the moment, I suppose you would find yourself reverting to phrases like without a shadow of a doubt <laughs> yeah. quite a lot. Um, or, or again, we, we don't know what Jeff's face is like when when these questions are being asked. Maybe he just is looking at him like a confused mole. <laughs> and Mark, Robin, Mark Robbins feels it's necessary to say to him, the, the point is over now. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> yeah. Um, right, okay, well, I think we've comprehensively covered everything there. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, Neil, thank you for, for, for being here. Thank you. And thank, thank you for you, fighting yes. through the illness. Yeah, yeah I'm Ed... really flagging. I don't remember the last half an hour. No, neither do I. Although I fear that when I listen to it back, 
it's not been great. Um, <laughs> Ed, it's been a pleasure. Well, no, thank you for letting me cash in on, on some of your podcast dollar. Yeah, um, that sweet podcast money that we've been um, creaming yeah. in these last few years. Look the, forward uh, to receiving that. Um, where can we find your, your penmanship um, in the near future? Um, well, it d- depends on the time frame that you're talking about. In three years, uh, hopefully, in an 80,000-word uh, thesis on british alternative stand-up comedy do you see um but in the uh, in the short term i might be writing a review of mickey adams autobiography for when saturday comes <laughs> so you know i've got a couple of irons in the fire <laughs> <laughs> of you've, differing significance you're very much a man that plays both the short and long game aren't you? <laughs> i really am yeah um thank you very much And thank you, listener. Bye.